I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Central America. And that actually begs a really important question. What exactly is Central America? I bet you've never actually took a moment to think about what defines something as Central America. And I bet if you're from North America, you have a different opinion of what Central America is than the rest of the world does, and definitely than Central America does. Let's talk about that, get in some history, some geography, and some just cultural artifacts right after that bump. My apologies for needing to take another video in the studio. I actually had some of you guys out hanging out today and we spent a really great day in Leon and out at the beach and we're gonna be doing some cool stuff coming up in the future. But today was a great day hanging out. I'm trying a different camera angle and a few different things. But I had this come up on the channel where someone was saying, no, you can't say Central America and Panama because obviously Panama is part of Central America, which of course, or it should be an of course, if you're from the United States or Canada, seems like, well, doesn't everyone think Panama is part of Central America? And if you're from anywhere else in the world, you think, well, obviously Panama has never been a part of Central America. Why would anyone think that? That doesn't make any sense. And if you're from here, you know that we refer to the region as Central America and Panama because Panama does border Central America. It does have a lot to do uh, geographically and other re with the region. And uh, it is the only country that directly borders Central America, which sounds like a weird thing to say, but it's true. There's no other country that has a hard border against Central America. So there's no other place that we need to refer to as an and unless we're going farther afield. So what is this Central America thing? And what do you mean that North Americans don't know where it is? That doesn't make any sense. We're taught it so much. It's a subregion of North America. Also something that most people in the world don't believe. So let's get into, first of all, there's three things here. One is geography, another is culture, and another is history. So let's start with that geography. So if we're looking at a map of the general region in which we expect to find Central America, there's some things we need to notice here. The first is that if you are from the US or Canada, then you probably know that the world is divided into North America and South America with the division between those regions being at the border between Panama and Colombia. Now we're going to get into later why Americans and Canadians teach this, but nowhere else in the world is this considered to be a continental border. There are two main schools of thought around the world. One is that all of the Americas are the Americas, or simply America, and it is a single continent with a really, really tiny land bridge connecting two larger portions. That is one popular way of looking at it. Another popular way of looking at it is that there are three regions, that there's North America, Central America, and South America, and generally, all of those are still considered to be one continent, but three distinct regions of that continent. Central Americans do not consider themselves to be a subregion of North America. Europeans do not generally consider the, that either. They consider this to be an independent region. Here in Central America, the term North American refers to people from Canada, the United States, or Mexico. You have to be from one of those three to be North American. People here are not North American. It is a reference to people not from here. And much in the same way, North Americans generally don't think of Central Americans as being North American, yet we're taught in every school, in every class, that Central America is part of North America. So they divide it in one way, but then tend to think of it in another culturally. So that's important. But what's really key here is that the way that North Americans are taught the physical geography of the region is different than the rest of the world. Now, of course, all of those things are human constructs. So it's always this group says this, this group says that, and you can make up your own mind because it's arbitrary, right? There's no underlying component to this other than eyeballing the region and saying what makes sense as divisions into different regions. But the world over, generally the consensus is that there is one continent and that uh, Central America may or may not be a distinct region within it geographically. The world does have a general definition of Central America beyond that. So that is the geography. And if we look carefully at the region, geographically, Panama is a little bit weird. When we picture it, and this is no one's fault, this is not caused by anybody, there's no like nefarious, it's just the land mass and the fact that North America sits generally over South America. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to notice. 
and to retain and to internalize. The North America primarily sits west of South America, and that Panama sits well south of South America, not south of the entire continent, but south of the north portion of it. In fact, much of Costa Rica does as well, and little bits of Nicaragua. So we're farther south in this region than you think, and we often sit alongside South America rather than over the top of it. But most people from North America tend to picture, and many people from Central America do as well, that this continent and its region sit over the top of South America, and that somehow Panama connects a little bit to the west, but essentially north-south. But Panama is not a north-south country, it's an east-west country. And not just a little bit east-west, completely east-west. So it's often very different than most people picture it or imagine that it is. And not too many people, just naturally, spend a lot of time looking at maps. So really sitting down and staring at the Isthmus of Panama and other things in the region, it's not something people tend to do, and it's not an area with a very large population, and so people don't tend to think about it very much. And when they do tend to think about it, they tend to be very focused on the Panama Canal, which, for logical reasons, is a really important part of the entire region. People think about the Panama Canal a lot, especially recently because of a lot of droughts causing problems with shipping, which raises logistics prices around the world, and that impacts a lot of people. So Panama has been a little bit important, but if I mention Panama and say, what is the importance of Panama? Nine out of 10 people, or possibly 99 out of 100 people, are going to say, well, it's really important for the Panama Canal. And I'd say, okay, give what, what do you mean as the importance of the Panama Canal, however? And they say, well, it's important because you can ship things from Pacific to Atlantic or vice versa, from Atlantic to Pacific. You say, okay, well, where is the Atlantic and Pacific? And they would say, are you an idiot? One is to the east and one is to the west of each other. Of course, if you spin the globe around, then the opposite, but that's not relevant. The point is that they sit east-west of each other regardless. You say, yeah, it's absolutely true. All of that is true. So because of those statements, you imagine that Panama allows a passage from east to west, but it does not. The Panama Canal runs directly north-south, the Atlantic Ocean sitting to the north and the Pacific Ocean sitting to the south. Of course, ships are going east-west, but they have to turn and do a north-south traversal to get through the isthmus. So that throws off a ton of people just from the way that they think about it, from the function that it serves, from the reason that we're aware of it seems to be an east-west purpose, and it is, but its actuality is north-south for traversal, therefore the country is east-west. And I used to live in Panama. I, my introduction to the region was living in Panama. Wonderful country. Love Panama to death. Uh, but when you live there, you really quickly become aware that it is not geographically positioned in the way that you generally imagine. Speaking of Panama and geography, we have another point here. When having the discussion that I had that brought this up, the person mentioned, well, of course, the P Panama is part of the region because it's part of the Central American Isthmus. Again, something that's generally not considered to be an isthmus. Central America is a large landmass, way too wide to be considered an isthmus. There are two isthmus within Central America. One is the Isthmus of Rivas here in Nicaragua. It's in the south, south of Nicaragua, but famously the city of Rivas and the famous party town of San Juan del Sur are places that lie within the isthmus. Technically, San Juan del Sur may be seen as being slightly south of the isthmus, but it is essentially there, very, very close, couple miles at most. It is an incredible incredibly narrow spit of land between Lago Nicaragua and the Pacific Ocean. So that is one isthmus. The other, the far more famous one, is the Isthmus of Panama. And at one point, its name was not Panama. It was simply the Isthmus Department, uh, because the isthmus portion of it was so important. But nowhere else in Central America is, in general terms, considered to be an isthmus. Uh, many people in North America, again, uniquely in that region, sometimes believe it to be so. And, of course, once again, an isthmus has a definition. There isn't, to the best of my knowledge, a super strict measurement to say one thing of a certain width is an isthmus and another one is not. But it is many times more wide, much more dramatic as a landmass than an isthmus normally is considered to be. So under normal definitions and by anything I can find, it is not an isthmus. It is simply uh, a relatively narrow, large portion of land. So when people say the Central American Isthmus, you should step back and say, wait, that's not an Isthmus that Panama is a part of. There is a narrow-ish region of Central America that touches, that goes north-south primarily, almost entirely, and then it turns when it connects to the Isthmus of Panama. So Panama is an Isthmus, Central America is not that also geographically separates Panama from the rest of Central or the rest of the region of Central America. 
So Panama lying south as part of South America, physically connecting to South America, and then bordering where it turns and where it widens. So the wider area, non-isthmus, is Central America. The narrow portion going east-west is the isthmus of Panama, not part of Central America. Okay, so geographically, that is why Panama has never really been considered a part of Central America. Now, if you're looking at a map and you, you zoom out a bit and you look at this region, it is completely reasonable to say, well, Panama seems to be kind of more a part of the Central American region than a part of the South American region because it is an isthmus and it's connected to the region of Costa Rica in Southern Central America, and that's pretty narrow. So it kind of flows one to another, but when it gets to the border with Colombia at Darien, and it is worth noting, in some older references, the Isthmus was also known as the Isthmus of Darien, uh, but is Darien and Panama are generally uh, interchangeable in this context, for those who are not aware, the state of Darien is the one that borders uh, Colombia all the way to the east, and the state of Panama is its counterpart to the west of it, not the west of the country, just Darien and Panama sit next to each other, and it is the departmento with the capital, and that borders the canal. But those two, uh, Darien and Panama, are the primary states and the famous states uh, within the country of Panama, and they are the ones that are referred to as Panamanian from even people inside of Panama, refer to that as Panama uh, and not the western portion. Uh, those parts are tightly associated with South America, culturally, historically, and so forth. They touch South America. They are severed from uh, Central America by the canal, obviously not a strong severing, um, but and those two are iconic, and the names of the region are often bouncing back and forth between the two. Now the region has become known as the Darien, but the state has become known as Panama, and the canal being the Panama Canal, and the canal being located in the state of Panama within the Panama slash Darien region, the canal got the name of Panama, and because whatever reason, the country eventually went with Panama instead of Darien for the entire region. But those two went back and forth quite a bit. That was an aside, and there's no reason to worry about the Darien name. But if you see the Darien name on anything, currently it refers to the easternmost state and the famous Darien Gap, the wild region where Panama connects to Colombia, that helps keep uh, animals and diseases from crossing uh, between the major uh, population zones. Uh, so because Panama and Darien lie so far south, uh, below the line of South America, geographically, they can be seen as part of South America. They can, it's reasonable to see them as associated with Central America geographically. Uh, it's reasonable to see that part of the region is Central America and part is not. Many people inside Panama see it this way, that west of the canal is kind of a merges into Central America and east of the canal is South American. Uh, when you do go east of the canal, it's very unreasonable to have any consideration of it being Central American, but geographically there's kind of a, an ambiguous zone there. It's not quite as clear cut as some other regions of the world. However, if you look at where Europe and Asia come together, there is no clear definition at all. The zone, the where the line is, uh, is a very loose thing and everyone can kind of make up their own space there. Uh, but when we're, we're dealing with Panama, geographically we generally consider it to be part of South America, but it's ambiguous. And if you want to feel that it physically is more connected to Central America, then by all means. Uh, traditionally, though, if it wasn't for the Darien Gap, if you actually study it, it is a bit more associated with South America geographically. The populations of Panama are up against the Colombian border, and the region against Costa Rica is generally empty. Same thing in Costa Rica. You have a lot of population farther from the border, and when you actually get right up to the border with Panama, there's not a whole lot going on there. So you have a zone that kind of acts as a buffer between them and Panama from a geographic dispersion perspective is very associated with Colombia rather than Costa Rica and its neighbors to the north. So that's geography. Now let's dig into culture and nationality. So traditionally, the reason that Central America is designated as it is is that it represents a very real thing traditionally. Now, of course, geography and other natural factors have over the millennia dictated why culture is what it is and where it is. In most cases, culture is heavily defined by a region's geography, and this makes a lot of sense, right? Europeans didn't spread into Asia because there were mountains in the way and some rivers that made it difficult and a lack of rivers that allowed them to easily traverse the region 
and no public or oceanic waterways that allow them to sail around the outside without going all the way around to Africa. So Europeans and Asians didn't spend a lot of time intermingling in the way that they might had there not been mountains in the way or had there been a river that flowed from one region to the other, making it easy for large amounts of cargo ships and such to go back and forth. This is a natural boundary. So North and South America have a kind of similar natural boundary as well. Over time, the narrow region of Central America played a very important role in blocking uh, transmission of major empires between the region. So let's step back just a little bit. If we get south of the United States, the modern United States, with no actual political connection to what the country is today, just that region, has, you know, a different uh, history in the pre-Columbian era. And we come into what is modern-day Mexico, especially centered around modern-day Mexico City, Ciudad de Mexico. When you're at Mexico City, you are at the traditional heartland, at least in the very close to pre-Columbian times, meaning just before Columbus got there, you had the region that was controlled by the Aztecs. So the Aztecs were a really big, powerful, imperial, did I say imperial? Imperial. Uh, pre-Columbian civilization, very powerful. They spread north dramatically, and some believe that they controlled large swaths of the western uh, region of what is now the United States, or at least at some point did, maybe not at the time that Columbus, Columbus had arrived, but in the past that they may have been very powerful throughout that region, and their language is found throughout a large area. As you go south from the Aztec realm, you run into primarily at the pre-Columbian time. Again, this is uh, all things like this are a single point in time, different groups, cultural groups and empires and all those things, they migrate around. So in you know, if we go farther back in history, we'll find different times where people are in different places. But at the time, that's very relevant to kind of a modern uh, framework and, and snapshot of what the pre-Columbian world looked like. As you traveled south in Mexico, in modern Mexico, you would come upon a region that was controlled by the Mayans. This included regions like the Yucatan, Chiapas, and basically everything south of there through what is modern day Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras. And that's where it ended. And that was the Mayan Empire, with a lot of its main sites located in modern day Guatemala and the Yucatan, but some important ones as far as southern Honduras. So that was the Mayan world, and it was different than the Aztec world, not just in culture, but in language as well. So these were two very important empires. When you got south of the Mayan world and you found a hard ridge, a literal geographic ridge in the, in the earth, and you went to the land south of that, you had a natural barrier that allowed the people who lived more as country folk in a much more wide open region were able to hold off the advances of the Mayan Empire in many parts because of the physical ridge making a physical geographic barrier. And geographic barriers are great for holding off armies and armed forces or causing problems in supply chains where it's difficult to, for example, send enough food to hold off an invading or to supply an invading army. So we have a tendency to see geographic features features become the barriers between regions or cultures naturally. So this is something we see, and now that modern border being the border between the modern states of Honduras and Nicaragua was the traditional barrier between the Mayan world and the Nicaragua world. The Nicaragua world were very closely related to the Mayan world, uh, but had a somewhat different culture and definitely a very importantly different history. Primarily, uh, from this vantage point in later history, uh, and from the point of this conversation, uh, experts in this region will have lots of great feedback as to why this may not be an actual major difference between the regions. Uh, the Mayan world was one of cities and major civilization and construction. The Nicaragua world, which today is primarily in the modern states of Nicaragua and Costa Rica, represented a large region that was primarily farming and agriculture. Uh, it was much more spread out, much more lightly populated, but their geographic position, distance from the major Mayan cities, and so forth allowed them to control the region without needing to have an empire. So this hinterland functioned as a southern border to Mayan expansion. As it went to the south and east, that region also because of its distance from major population centers, managed to serve as a hinterland in the other direction against the Incan uh, empires of the South American region, which did manage to come into uh, Panama, but not into modern day Costa Rica, and so roughly. And so uh, this region of southern Central America today 
was an important barrier zone. So when we're looking at what we consider to be Central America today, and we're going to enumerate those locations in just a minute as to the modern definition, what we have is basically two key regions, the former Mayan Empire and the roughly associated Nicaragua or Mayan hinterland, uh, whether it was tightly enough to be considered the Mayan hinterland or simply the hinterland south of the Mayan civilization, but it was populated by what we now know as the Nicaragua, hence the name Nicaragua, and Costa Rica simply means rich coast, so it was a, another region that was uh, roughly all one thing but had more of the cities and less of the farming land than Nicaragua. Nicaragua today is the truly agricultural area, both today and in heritage. Now, what do we generally actually consider to be Central America? Because it's not as easy to define as people would often have you believe. Now, I understand we're doing an entire video breaking down what is and isn't Central America, so clearly we are not super clear on the world all knowing what it is, so absolutely. But let's start to enumerate it. There are a number of countries that are considered free and clear to be and always be without any question Central America. And from the south going north, that is Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Belize. Those countries are always Central America. There is no definition that is considered appropriate in any way that does not include all of those countries. We generally refer to the region as Central America, those countries, plus Panama, to make it clear that we are not lumping Panama in with Central America from a cultural or historical standpoint, but it does play an important part of the region, and so we include it. Very importantly, traditionally, there was another state that was identified as being part of Central America, both discreetly and as a region and as part of the Mayan Empire. That region used to be known as Los Altos. It was absorbed into the Mexican state of Chiapas voluntarily on the part of Los Altos in the 1800s. It was for a while an independent state and then at a time part of Guatemala and then a group of people within that region annex themselves to Mexico. We can cover the details of that in some other video. Uh, and they are voluntarily now part of the Chiapas zone in Mexico, while other parts of what was Los Altos, including its former capital, known as Shela or Quetzaltenango, is still part of Guatemala today. So Guatemala is the one country in the region that contains two of the traditional capitals, but not all of the uh, land associated with the original additional state. So Mexico is generally considered to contain a small amount of Central America. Now, confusingly, there was a larger expanse of the Mayan world that went into what is not ever considered to be Central America, but is a borderland today in Mexico. Primarily, that is in the Yucatan, in the area very close to Belize. We don't consider that region, such as the area south of Merida, to be part of Central America, even though it is geographically very close and uh, politically in history possibly should have been included with that region or very tightly connected to that region, but it is considered that the Mayan world simply sprawled into what is modern North America uh, and it didn't follow geographic lines exactly because they're not bound to do so and they didn't and so they had major capitals up there. So it is important to understand that there are parts of the Mayan world that spread beyond the, the north boundaries of what is considered Central America, but there are parts of Central America that are in Mexico, but they don't necessarily coincide with the Mayan world and definitely do not coincide in the Yucatan. Chiapas is a different region closer to the Pacific Ocean, uh, which you can see if you look at the uh, Guatemalan border, uh, there is a region that touches very close to Quetzaltenango, and that is where Los, uh, the northern portion of Los Altos still exists within Mexico today. So those countries are considered clean to be uh, Central America, plus this little bit that's inside Mexico, and some people will give small portions of extreme western Panama also to Central America, which is a reasonable thing to do, but it's important to understand that Mexico itself is not Central America, Panama itself is not Central America. It is because uh, there is a hard geographic border uh, at Panama that we almost universally recognize. It is rare, rare to ever discuss if Western Panama has any uh, portion of it that we would call Central America. Uh, that is why Panama is considered the first bordering country to Central America, whereas Mexico has a soft border as some parts of Central America in every context, whether it's historical, cultural, geographic, uh, or, or, or former actual political boundary, a national sovereign boundary, fall within the modern state of Mexico. And so Mexico technically is 
has a portion of it that is part of Central America, but Mexico proper is not Central America. Hope, hope that portion is clear. Now, many people like to exclude Belize from a list of Central America because it is culturally so different than the rest, and the rest, all of the rest, have a very tight historical and cultural affinity. This is not really fair because, one, Central America is not a cultural zone as much as there is a very major trend within it, uh, such as speaking Spanish, and Belize does not speak Spanish, it speaks English. However, uh, that is unfair. Uh, if, even if you were going to look at it culturally, in the historic context, when it became Central America, it was a part of the rest of it. It was part of the Mayan world. It was not separate in any way. It being separate, having a separate language, having a separate history, having a separate uh, political entity, any of those things are very, very modern, recent constructs caused by the colonial era and changes in the uh, in colonial status and not because of anything historical and nothing that would be appropriate to apply to the definition of what is or is in Central America. So don't, don't, will allow anyone to try to make an argument that Belize is not actually Central America. It is in every sense. If you're looking at what countries were members of Central America, which people can call themselves Central Americans as part of the former union, we'll talk about that in a second, then yes, Belize was not a part of that. But in a historical context, when we're talking about the region of Central America, what is Central America, Belize is absolutely a part of that. And importantly, even though that they are generally on friendly grounds today, Guatemala does claim over 50%, it's like 55% of the landmass of Belize is claimed to be part of Guatemala. And that also would lend itself to saying not only is it part of uh, uh, Central America in other senses, it may actually be a part of Guatemala. I'm not going to get into that particular argument, simply saying that Guatemala and Belize have a disputed zone and that causes overlap. And importantly, because of that dispute, it means that at least in the eyes of the Central American uh, Confederation, which we'll talk about, the United States, uh, the United uh, Provinces of Central America, that Belize, at least in majority, was a part of that as well, just a part that never got to really participate. All right, some important political history that helps define why this area is the way that it was. If we go back to the early colonial period, this is when Spain had controlled the entire region. During most of that time, now there was some fluctuation, and this is all very complex because it's a lot of changes over a long period of time without the best record keeping because we're talking 500 plus years ago. But the region to the north was known as New Spain. This included Mexico and what we today consider Central America. The region to the south and or east was generally known as New Granada, uh, before that uh, Tierra Firma, and at some points now and then simply as part of the Viceroy of Peru. But this fluctuated around but was pretty consistent that New Spain was on one side and we will refer to it as New Granada on the other the barrier between these two, the border zone or the frontera that separated these two is still today the Costa Rican Panamanian border. So Panama was always a member of New Granada, Peru, Peru uh, Tierra Firma, uh, and Central America, including Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and all the rest were always a part of New Spain until they all gained independence in the 1800s. So there was always, from the very, very earliest days of Spanish colonial input, they recognized that the worlds here were separated at that barrier line and drew that line there. And we know historically and culturally there's a good reason for this. This all made sense from the Spanish perspective. Now, obviously, Spain's colonial decisions can't be taken as law by any such strategy, right? Like that's not, in, not right to do so. We need to look at the historic context. But in this case, it appears that Spain was using proper cultural history to make this particular uh, political um, um, decision, right? So that establishes that even at that time, it was seen to be the case, and throughout the entire colonial period, many hundreds of years, uh, that was held. So whatever had caused that decision initially was reinforced by that decision over time. Later, when both regions disintegrated, we had uh, the border of Mexico went all the way through what is today Costa Rica. So at one point, that was Mexico in the post-colonial period, uh, immediately following the dissolution of New Spain and the uh, 1821 independence from Spain. 
And at the same time, roughly, when uh, uh, New Granada was able to um, uh, free itself from Spain, that particular region that today includes Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and importantly, Panama, was Gran Colombia. So in both these cases, we have modern states that are represented by previous states that were much larger. Mexico covering this entire region to the north and to the east or south. Gran Colombia, or modern-day Colombia, covered all of that zone. Now, of course, very quickly, Mexico dissolved into uh, uh, subsequent states. The key one here being that the current states of Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, including its subzone of Los Altos, and in some ways, modern day Belize, but that's disputed, formed an alliance known by several names, but the United Provinces of Central America or the Central American Federation or the Federated States of Central America and many other related names. They were very bad at coming up with a strict name. They actually changed it a few times and just got sloppy and used a few different names uh, on official documents. So it gets really messy, but the Central American Republic uh, was formed, the Republic of Central America, however you want to put it. And since its name was in Spanish, and still just as bad with all these different variations. Once we turn it into English, you really have a lot to work with. Uh, that region was really codified as Central America at that point uh, by political division and only the tiniest slivers of what might maybe somehow be considered Central America at that point fell into Mexico. In not too much time, some pieces of Guatemala and Central America would be carved off and join Mexico politically, but at this time, basically none or possibly none that would be considered that. So we now have a nation known as Central America and Panama was still part of Colombia for another nearly 100 years. So we have a very clear division of what these things were uh, at, at this time. And, and so, you know, this, this gives a lot. And, and with a political entity, with the name Central America, the peoples, the pueblos, of those countries today have a certain claim, uh, both culturally and historically and geographically, but importantly, politically, to being Central Americans. People from other places really have a difficult time justifying the use of uh, the, 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 uh, the epitaph uh, of um, Central American because they were not members of that state, right? It's not just a region. There is an actual political union known as Central America, and the people of it were Central American. Of course, they still maintain their identities, Guatemalteca, Nicaraguense, and so forth, but their, their overall, as a group, were Central Americans, just as Texans and New Yorkers are Americans, or Estadounidenses, today in the United States, uh, anyone from anywhere in the United States gets to be American as a political, not as a not as a geographic region. I know that there's we have a whole video on why some people call everyone American and some people just from America, but the United States has a is the only place where the political entity, the people, are officially known as American. There's no one else who's American. Central Americans have a similar thing that they have a political, actual passport carrying identity as Central Americans, and today. While Costa Rica has mostly separated itself from the rest of those, the others have maintained a certain political affinity for each other and share a border zone to this day. Now, Costa Rica has voluntarily not become a part of that, but it is part of the integration group for the region. So it still maintains a very close tie to its neighbors, its historic partners in the Central American Republic, uh, but it, it is a little bit less than the other four are with each other. Now, very importantly, not only do we have this 500 years ago, not only do we have this 200 years ago, like step after step that make this really clear as to why uh, it should be Central America in that way. We have a really important event that happens in 1903, and this is going to lead us to why we have problems today. In 1903, Panama, backed by the United States with a very strong interest in making Panama no longer independent and able to operate on its own within the region, managed to get Panama separated as an independent zone from its parent nation of Colombia. In 1903, Panama became its own country, but not on its own because the United States was involved. And to justify American involvement in Panama, after the fact, 
because America was interested in the, the Panama Canal. They wanted to have control of the zone. Panama became a colony in, in all generally acceptable ways, right? It was a, a relatively secret colony of the United States uh, over the period of much of the 20th century. Eventually, Panama, but only in re very recent times, has Panama managed to free itself of U.S. control uh, with U.S. military stationed there for most of the 20th century. Like, this is an extreme example of, of modern colonialism. Uh, Panama, because of these things, in order to justify to the world, and especially to Americans, the occupation of, the control of, the intervention in Panama, the separating of a nation, the colonization of a new country, because Americans as well do not generally accept the concept of colonization too easily, just like our Latin American uh, brethren, the idea of being colonized isn't super awesome. Having been colonies ourselves, uh, we don't see that as a, as a positive. Now, Americans don't see it as the negative in the same way that Latin Americans do, because Latin Americans were populated zones that were forcibly colonized, whereas the United States was primarily an empty zone that was mostly voluntarily colonized. Now, I know people who are of Native American descent are going to say that's not exactly the right story, but it is actually true that large swaths of North America were actually primarily empty. Uh, and population was filling that zone. That is not to diminish the horrific genocides that occurred and the terrible atrocities that happened to the small uh, the small population zones that remained at the time of the colonization. Those things were horrific and terrible and could not be justified uh, in any sense at any time in history ever. But it is a different thing that the majority of the resulting population of the United States was people who came from the colonists. Right, the, the majority of the population of the United States today and 200 years ago were the descendants of Europeans who had come to colonize the zone. The vast majority of the population in Latin America is not. It is, it is people who are descended from the peoples who were there before the colonization. Uh, now, much of that North America is because of many more people coming over with many fewer people being there already, but also a much higher rate of genocide, right? So there's a lot of terrible reasons and a lot of just natural reasons that go together. And this is not a study in that, but this is, but this is throughout the region, colonization is generally seen as a negative. The United States colonizing Panama was not easily accepted. And to make that more easily accepted at some point after 1903, a propaganda campaign was begun and the idea that Panama should be considered Central America in order to take away their identity and to separate their history from Nueva Granada, to separate their history from Gran Colombia, to make it seem like Panama had somehow been um, unfairly ripped away from its, its neighbors in Central America and attached to South America was done during the 20th century. And in very heavily taught, if you come from American or Canadian schools, you will be taught that this whole region is North America, that Panama is a Central American country, and it's never even suggested that this might be a little bit inaccurate, that people in the region don't consider it so, that we are unique in making this claim. It is simply presented as fact, as if there's no question, and of course, without it being an area of particular interest, why would anyone look into it and say, why that doesn't make any sense, that's not part of Central America. So this is a very powerful uh, piece that has proven to be incredibly powerful to the point where someone came onto my channel and, and exactly repeated this. Oh, Panama is part of Central America. How could you say it's not? Historically, it's been. The isthmus is called Central America, all of which is wrong. Panama has always been South America. The idea that it is Central America is brand new, last generation revisionist history, unique to one zone from the zone that colonized it. In Panama, it is not seen that way. In Colombia, it is not seen that way. In all of South America, it is seen as part of, part of South America. In all of Central America, it is seen as part of South America. In all of Europe and all the rest of the world, it is generally seen as part of South America, part of its historic of, if they think about it at all, which is very far away and very small. People don't tend to put a lot of thought into it, which is the power of, of something like this. It's always been that uh, uh, Panama is, is part of the Gran Colombia and the Nueva Granada tradition, and before that time, part of the South American imperial tradition, and that it has no association with Central America. So it is, if you hear this, 
think to yourself, ooh, I bet I'm hearing something coming from North America that was generated during the 20th century from regions that had a very strong interest in promoting the idea of Central American unity for Panama, which of course then they didn't get unity with Central America. They've never, they've never integrated with it. They've never worked with it. They are still just as separated as they've as they've always been. They don't see themselves. And and having lived in Panama and lived in Central America, there is such a wild difference in culture, in style of living, in just everyday life. They are very different places, and Panama feels much more like a South American place for a reason. And the amount of work that went into now, no one, no one's even concerned, right? We're, we're so far past the point where any of this matters, but it would require re-education now in North America to go back and be like, oh, wait, no, we, we kind of redefined the region for a little while for our own purposes, but now we can go back and give you the right information. But generations of Americans and Canadians have grown up having been taught that Panama was the core, let alone the, the fringe of Central America, the very thing that defines Central America. And so the, uh, the, the idea that we would go back, check our textbooks, fix this information just really isn't there. But luckily we have resources like Wikipedia and we're able to go out and, and look these things up today and be like, oh, wow, there's a lot of information that shows this history and why this happened. And now we understand why, like we now know how important it was for this to be uh, seen in this light in order to justify the actions of much of the 20th century. Uh, and, and we see how powerful that was. Americans really did believe and still do clearly just believe that, well, it must be Central America for reasons that seem to make sense. But when you study the history, study the geography, study the cultures, you realize that not only does it not make sense today to lump it into that picture but it never did historically and never was historically. Up until some time after 1903, absolutely no one had ever considered that Panama could possibly be part of Central America. So that gives you a pretty good picture of exactly what is Central America. And now when you look at a map, you'll have a little bit more appreciation for what the region is, why it's shaped the way it is. I mean, it's shaped the way it is because of geography, because, because of the moving tectonic plates, but why the region has such an affinity for each other, its cultural zones. Uh, you'll understand that the northern uh, two-thirds of the zone and the majority of the population and the majority of the cities are in the Mayan zone and the majority of the farmland and the open wilds and the lowlands and the, the smaller population are in the southern hinterlands and why the barrier with Panama is such an important one historically and politically and culturally, and why the border with Mexico is such a soft border and such a transition zone because portions of Central America have fallen over the line, and why the disagreements over Belize remain important uh, but are generally seen as very uh, passive and uh, non-aggressive today, and, uh, and why talk today of reunification may be very important. We'll do more videos in the future, uh, and definitely get in the comments and let me know what you think of doing some of this history and break downs of the region. Today I had I was on the uh, beach and doing interviews and stuff all day and uh, so I didn't have a chance to do a video so I had to do this but I had this on my list to do already. I think it's fantastic information that, that we really need to dig into to understand the region. Like this is really important for knowing where you might be and how things fit together. Uh, but looking into the history of, of the Central American Republic and when it first formed, when it reformed, when it attempted to form and where we are today discussing reunification, something that literally came up in conversation today. Uh, this is a very modern thing that's going on as well. We are still in the history of this region in a brand new sense. Central America as an identity is relatively young. Uh, and, and that's something we also discussed on the channel recently. When exactly is the formation of Nicaragua? It has had so many fits and starts and separations and sovereignty and non-sovereignty and colonial status and recolonial status over the last 200 years, 204 years, that it's really worth digging into that as well. And we definitely will in a future episode. So Thank you so much for joining me. Get down those comments, uh, say hello, ask your questions, let me know what you think, uh, add more feedback, all that stuff. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I really appreciate everyone who does that. It shows a lot of support and really means a lot to me and helps with all the, the cameras and stuff. This is very expensive to do. 
As always, take a moment to share on social media and tell someone you know about the show. Share this with them. Let them know that there's this interesting education to be had out there and a daily show that they can subscribe to and become an addict uh, and join our little vlogging, uh, relocation, travel, Central American, everything, Latin America, travel thing, channel here. And I'll see all of you tomorrow. And all right, you know the drill. Four videos may be on the screen. I'm terrible at getting them up in a timely manner. But once they're there, click on one of them. And if you don't see one, just take that extra second to scroll over to the side or down below. Find a video from my feed, from Generic Expats, from uh, Immense Coffee, and, and click uh, watch that. Nicaragua 360, Drive Warp. This is Nicaragua. You name it. Find one of our shows. 